Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the different treatment strategies and different modalities that are designed for chronic suicidality. So chronic suicidality is really much different than acute suicidality in terms of clinical work. So if somebody comes in to see a mental health clinician and they say that they're going to commit suicide, that they have intent and they have a plan and they have ideation, then even though, of course, this is distressing, from a mental health clinician's point of view, the actions that need to be taken are usually fairly clear. You want to protect that person. You want to get them to the hospital or whatever other protocols in place that would protect them. When somebody's chronically suicidal, it becomes more difficult in terms of what treatment and what techniques to use because hospitalization is not always a good idea in those situations. So I'll talk about that more in a few moments, but first some kind of general aspects of chronic suicidality. Anyone can be chronically suicidal, but usually when we look in the research literature, we're going to find more articles around borderline personality disorder and specifically about women who have been traumatized. So that is a population that's more affected by chronic suicidality, but again, anyone can be chronically suicidal. And there's no single agreed upon definition for what chronic suicidality is, for what it means. There are some different thoughts about it, and I'll review that, but there is no single agreed upon definition. So I used a few articles to help create this video. One in particular that I relied on a bit more was published in 2017. I'll put all the references for these articles in the description for this video. But this particular article, I think, really looked at chronic suicidality and really suicidality in general through a clinical lens. I think they did an excellent job in this article. So again, a lot of the pieces from this video came from that article. And I think it's worth reading if you have an interest in treating individuals who have chronic suicidality. So in terms of a definition that we can use for chronic suicidality, we would say that this construct is when we see clinically concerning persistent or repetitively intermittent passive or active suicidal thoughts, planning, or occasional suicide attempts. So a lot of components have to be weighed carefully here to figure out if somebody is suicidal or chronically suicidal. So the way I think about chronic suicidality in some instances is really similar to how I think about suicidality in general, but over a longer period of time. It's a presentation that you see over and over as opposed to one time when somebody's under a lot of stress and they're thinking about suicide. It's when somebody comes in repeatedly and talks about suicide and has, again, ideation, intent, and plan some of the times. Although a lot of times we think of this as mostly the ideation in terms of clinical treatment. They come in with these suicidal thoughts kind of over and over again. And I look at this as like a scale, like a balance. So on one side, we see factors that may push somebody toward suicidal ideation, like mental disorders, personality difficulties, stresses, traumas, and other social and cultural influences. On the other side of this scale, or this balance, we see life-sustaining motivations, inhibitions against suicide, and resiliency. So I think what happens with chronic suicidality is these two forces are roughly equal. So the scale is kept kind of in balance. Somebody's not moving in a direction necessarily where they're going to commit suicide that day, and they're not moving in a direction where they're going to give up that ideation altogether, or that ideation is going to be absent altogether. So they're stuck in kind of this awful place where they're suicidal much of the time and they can't seem to move in a direction toward reduced ideation. So we associate this with depression and hopelessness and other problems that are hard to move. All these kind of instances where obstacles just can't be removed very easily. So it is a very challenging position for a client to be in and from a clinical point of view it's a challenging presentation for a mental health counselor. Now one thing that I've noticed about these types of situations is there's this idea that the elements that are pushing somebody towards suicide and the elements that are protecting them from suicide are both stable, but that's not always the case. In both directions we can see that some of these 
different stressors and life-sustaining motivations can change. They can be transient, and this can be problematic, again, in terms of treatment and protecting the client. So I've seen situations before clinically where a client will be chronically suicidal and they'll kind of have a particular life-sustaining motivation that's temporary that they're holding out and saying, well, as long as this stays in place, I won't commit suicide. For example, they might say, well, I have a pet, and as long as that pet is alive, I won't commit suicide. So that life-sustaining element is transient, right? Depending on how old the pet is and how long it's expected to live, that could be transient. Or they might say, look, I have good housing right now, or I have a good apartment, but if I lose that, I'll commit suicide. Or if I lose my job, I'll commit suicide. So really the threat of suicide becomes contingent on something the mental health clinician can't control. And it throws or threatens to throw the balance off I talked about before. Because again, some of these elements are transient. Some of these elements can change. And that can be a real problem in terms of keeping someone safe. It's also worth noting here that, again, this can be bidirectional. You can be working with somebody and the stressor that's pushing them toward suicide that can be removed. For example, they can be in a relationship that's really abusive and that's leading them to have suicidal ideation and that relational partner can leave. They can go and find another relationship and that can be both a stressor but also a relief. So it's not necessarily that good things in a person's life could go away. Also unpleasant or negative elements can go away as well. So we have to keep in mind that we're always looking for a way to help the client move away from suicidal ideation. So that's keeping things that are good in place and helping them to remove stressors. Both of those are parts of strategies that can be employed from a clinical perspective. So what about specific treatment modalities to prevent suicide? So we see a number of strategies that have been designed to treat suicidal ideation and to try to reduce the number of actual attempts. Some of these therapies are specifically designed for that, and some of these therapies have components that are used for that. So we see psychodynamic interpersonal therapy, cognitive therapy for suicide prevention, CBT in general, DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. We see problem-solving therapy, mentalization-based therapy. We see the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality program, and transference-focused therapy. So a lot of therapies that are developed specifically to help people to move away from suicidal ideation and, of course, not to have a suicide attempt. What's interesting about these therapies, though, is their track record in actually preventing the rates of completed suicide is really unclear. We see a lot of small sample sizes and methodologies that aren't really solid with a number of studies on these modalities. So you have to assess clients individually and carefully. The one paper I read had an interesting quote that I've seen before. All models are wrong, but some are useful. This is actually a good way to think about therapeutic modalities when it comes to chronic suicidality. There may be a model that you really like, but for a certain individual, it might not be effective. So it might be better to think of all the models as wrong, but some components might still be useful, and you can tailor the components to the individual's needs. So as I indicated, it's unclear if any of these modalities actually decrease the rates of completed suicide, so why would we use them? Well, there's some evidence they can decrease suicidal ideation, and it also is highly dependent on the underlying cause, like what's causing the ideation or the suicidal behavior. In terms of mental disorders, if it's something like borderline personality disorder, CBT and DBT have been shown to be somewhat effective in reducing suicidal behavior. But for other disorders like schizophrenia or major depressive disorder, none of these modalities has really stood out dramatically as being successful. It's a very difficult situation. Chronic suicidality is difficult to treat. There's really no two ways about that. So are there any common features with all those therapies I mentioned before? Well, we see a lot of strategies that are shared among many of those modalities. For example, helping clients to tolerate internal states, reduce impulsivity, and improve their ability to regulate emotions. That's fairly common. We also see this strategy to help clients appreciate the relationship between emotions, feelings, interpersonal relationships, and behaviors. We see strategies that address self-destructive behaviors, 
and self-harm in general. We see techniques designed around problem solving, gaining new perspectives, increasing self-awareness, and also helping the mental health clinician to increase self-awareness and how they're feeling toward a client who's chronically suicidal. And of course with these modalities we see this idea of formulating a safety plan and trying to manage crises that occur between mental health treatment sessions, between counseling sessions. So this could involve a variety of alternative coping methods, action plans, and relying on external resources. Now one of the challenging things about chronic suicidality is that mental health clinicians have varying attitudes towards suicide and they have different abilities, different capacities in terms of their competence to handle chronic suicidality. So we see these divided up in a few different categories. So the first would be death anxieties. So mental health clinicians are people. So they have concerns about their own mortality and about the mortality of their loved ones and friends. So when a client starts to talk about suicide, that can create death anxiety for a clinician. So I think here, in terms of death anxiety, mental health clinicians have to be really okay at some level with the idea of mortality. It's a morbid subject matter, right? People don't like to talk about it. But I think in order to help clients who are chronically suicidal, mental health clinicians really have to have clear values and a clear understanding of their own philosophy about death. They need to be comfortable with death and talking about death. So if somebody has a tremendous level of death anxiety as a clinician, they're not going to want to talk to clients about that. We see other kind of attitudes as well with mental health clinicians in terms of how they think about suicide and values in human life. For example, there are different opinions on whether individuals have the right to take their own lives. We see clinicians that believe that suicide is always wrong, regardless of extenuating circumstances. And we see clinicians who believe that every measure should be taken to avert every suicide. And of course, those two values are fairly consistent with one another. We also see other points of view, like some clinicians believe that some suicidal behavior is not due to mental illness, but rather to existential dilemmas, and there's no acceptable alternative. So they believe in some instances that there are valid reasons why people would want to commit suicide that aren't related to mental illness at all. We also see this perspective where some clinicians believe that some clients might be better off not being alive, and that some lives aren't worth saving. I think if you look at all mental health clinicians, this is an attitude that wouldn't be fairly common, but I have seen this. I have seen mental health clinicians that look at a client, they look at a particular situation, and they think they might be better off not being here. Or they might work with a client who's committed several horrible, heinous crimes, and been in and out of prison, and have addiction, and lots of suffering, and they just view that particular client and say, that life might not be worth living. Now this is not something I agree with in terms of my attitude toward suicide and how it relates to counseling. I think that all lives are worth saving. And I think that mental illness is the cause of the vast majority of suicidal ideation. So I talk about this before in another video, but I don't have this opinion that clients are better off not being here. I think that as mental health clinicians, that is an opinion again that we see, and I appreciate there's different perspectives. But in terms of what I believe, I believe that lives are worth saving and that mental health clinicians have to do their best to prevent suicide. Another difference we see among clinicians is the capacity for compassion. The ability to be fully present with a client who's talking about these difficult subject matters like their suicidal ideation and their plans and all the anguish associated with that. And this is really somebody that can do this without checking out. Right? What happens sometimes with mental health clinicians when the stories get rough is they kind of check out in order to protect themselves. This is understandable, but when you're talking about certain situations like suicide, you have to be able to stay in the game as a clinician. You have to stay empathetic and stay tuned in and not activate those checking out mechanisms. That's not helpful for the client. Now, the other side of this, of course, is if somebody is empathizing all the time, and that is kind of blurring the line between empathy and sympathy, so understanding how somebody feels versus feeling how somebody feels, this can result in compassion fatigue, and this doesn't help clients either. So this isn't a simple issue. 
we have to have the capacity for empathy and compassion, but we also have to be careful how we use it. So it can be tricky at times. It's not always a clear right or wrong or good or bad when it comes to how mental health clinicians approach empathy and compassion. Another difference with clinicians we see is risk aversion. Sometimes when a client says that they're suicidal or they have ideation, immediately clinicians start worrying about liability. How will they be perceived by their peers, authorities, colleagues? How will their reputation be affected? And I think that this can result in clinicians being highly conservative, so taking more extreme actions to protect the client than may be necessary or helpful. For example, always jumping toward hospitalization. If somebody's risk averse and then a client mentions suicide, that risk averse clinician is more at risk to hospitalize. So you have to be careful here with risk aversion. Of course, there's risk. There's always risk when dealing with clients, but you have to manage that fear of risk in order to be helpful to the client. We also see differences in the capacity to confront difficult issues, and this really relates to the risk aversion. So some clinicians are not comfortable with providing psychotherapy to chronically suicidal clients because they're worried that they're going to inadvertently provoke suicide by saying something wrong or saying something at the wrong time. And I've heard this many times, clinicians who are afraid to mention the word suicide because they're afraid they'll be interpreted as recommending suicide. And we know that in clinical work, there are definitely certain times when you don't want to bring up the idea of suicide. But in general, clients know that suicide is an option. People know that suicide is an option. And it's really unlikely that you're going to cause a suicide by bringing it up. It's actually more likely that you can have a frank conversation and help the client because they realize you're comfortable talking about the topic. So I can appreciate this. And again, as I mentioned, research indicates there are times when bringing up suicide isn't a good idea. But in general, I think we need to be okay with these types of discussions. And we need to follow good practice to make sure that if the topic is brought up, we can deal with it and to help the client move to a place where they're not going to be suicidal. Clinicians have differences when it comes to intervening as well. So if somebody is suicidal, clinicians have to be able to actively intervene to know the protocols to take. Now this seems obvious, but some clinicians don't have that training. They don't know what to do if somebody's in their office and suicidal. And we also see that clinicians need to be willing to accept at some level that clients are ultimately responsible for their own actions. There's really no escaping this. There's diminished capacity and there's times when people are going to be less in control than other times. But in the end, the client has to decide what they're going to do. And we try to help clients move in a direction away from suicide, of course. But some clients decide to do it anyway. And clinicians have to accept that. So with the nature of chronic suicidality in mind and all these different variables when it comes to clinical skill, what are some strategies for dealing with chronic suicidality? So as I list through these, it's always important to keep in mind that the strategies have to be tailored to the individual. Each individual is going to present differently. These are just general strategies that we see in the research literature, and specifically this one article I mentioned before that was published in 2017. So we see here that clients seem to be best served by clinicians who can focus on the therapeutic alliance. That's a key part of really all counseling. They're best served by clinicians who can actively engage them and their families to the extent that the client is okay with that. Clients are best served by clinicians who can actively engage them and talking directly about the warning signs and the risk factors and the topic of suicide. They're best served by clinicians who don't take suicidal behaviors personally. It's about the client, not about the clinician. Also, it's helpful and I think this is one thing I've seen many times is true, to the extent it's possible or ethical to involve the family in the ongoing care of somebody who's chronically suicidal. We can't always rely on mental health clinicians, hospitals, the police. The family is there often. The family understands the client well much of the time. Now, of course, this is dependent on the situation a person's in, but if they have a supportive family, I think usually it makes sense to involve them, again, when ethically that's permitted. For example, when a client consents to that. 
And the last strategy I'll cover here is around the safety first as a prime consideration. That's something we hear a lot in the world of mental health treatment when it comes to suicidality or chronic suicidality. So with this idea in mind that the prime consideration is safety first, it's important to realize that the strategies that have been developed to deal with acute, urgent suicidality are usually not appropriate for individuals who are chronically suicidal. So really what I'm talking about here is Again, hospitalization, this is what we usually think of for acute suicidality. It may not be the right thing for a client who's chronically suicidal. Sometimes it can actually cause more bad than good. It can cause more negative than positive. Now, sometimes when somebody's chronically suicidal, the hospital does make sense. So it's important, again, we have to look at each individual circumstance. But in general, it's just a good idea to keep in mind that the strategies for acute are different than the strategies for chronic. So I'll end this video with some self-talk that mental health clinicians can apply when they're thinking about dealing with suicidal presentations. And I think this is particularly important for counselors who are relatively new to the mental health treatment community, but really these apply to people regardless of their experience level. So the first self-talk item, so this is a self-statement, this is something a clinician can tell themselves when they're thinking about a client who's suicidal. Some cases will turn out bad regardless of what you do and how good you are. No two ways about this. We can't control everything as mental health clinicians. The next one, dealing with suicide turns rookies into veterans. It's part of professional development. I really like this particular self-statement because we really have to learn from these experiences. So if somebody's avoiding suicidal clients or avoiding talking about suicide with clients who are suicidal, they're not really helping themselves in terms of developing into a professional. We need these experiences as clinicians to get better. We need to deal with these topics head on in order to become good counselors. The next self-statement is, I can only help clients want to stay alive, but I can't actually keep them alive. And this is true. We can help build motivation away from suicidal ideation and toward life-sustaining motivation, but we can't follow the clients home we can't watch them in their house. There are simply limits to what mental health clinicians can do. And this self-statement really addresses those limits. Next one is, I've done whatever possible about alerting, forewarning, and preparing the family. So again, this is an instance where you're allowed to have contact with the family in terms of a client is suicidal and their family. So yes, if we've done whatever we can do, if we've told them what's going on and we've tried to involve them in the care, and they have engaged or haven't engaged either way. If we've done whatever is possible, then we have to accept that. We have to be okay with that. So there are a lot of aspects to providing quality care as a mental health clinician when talking about chronic suicidality. If you have any thoughts on this topic, I know the topic of suicide is relatively controversial. If you have any thoughts, if you agree or disagree with any of the things I've talked about here, Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comment section. I think that topics like this are important to discuss. I think we have to, again, discuss suicide in a frank and direct way and not avoid it because it is an unpleasant topic. As always, I hope you found this description of chronic suicidality to be interesting. Thanks for watching.